Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your patience. We are four minutes late, I apologize. Technology uh, sometimes adds a little bit of time to your, your day. So thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Christine Muir. I am the community librarian at Cary Library. I am recording this event and I am also streaming it live to Facebook, just so everyone knows. I am so excited to be partnering with IAL on hosting this fifth annual college and career workshop. Today's event will begin with a keynote speaker followed by a panel discussion that will wrap up at 2.30. We will have smaller breakout sessions at three o'clock and four o'clock, giving you an opportunity to speak in smaller groups with some of the experts you'll hear from during this panel. Our four o'clock session still has some spots and we'll put the registration link in the chat at the end of this event so that if you wanna sign up, you can do that. Um, now I am going to turn things over to Monsi, who is a Lexington High School alum, a member of the IAL school committee and the creator of this workshop. Thank you, Monsi. Thank you, Christine, uh, for all the ways that you have helped us put this event together. This is our first digital event and it would not have been possible without the support of you and Cary Memorial Library. Hello, my name is Manasi Singhal and on behalf of the school committee of the Indian Americans of Lexington, I would like to welcome you to our fifth annual college and career workshop on multiple pathways to success. The purpose of this workshop series is to help reduce stress and competition um, as well as to promote the well-being of our students by encouraging them to seek out their own unique ways to stand out rather than competing for the same resources to look like many others. As an alumni of LHS myself, I walk this path of taking all honors and AP courses, attending a top 10 school, but it is only afterwards when I graduated that I realized that there were many other um, options open to me that I could have taken that may have made me much happier. After many years working, I moved back to Lexington to pursue becoming a teacher, which I had discovered was what I really loved doing and began to think about how I could help the next generations broaden their perspectives to help reduce their burdens and help them find their best ways forward. This year's theme is to look forward to the future. With the advent of the pandemic back in March, our students live in a very different world than we could have ever imagined. While there have been many changes and negative impacts, this time has also given us the opportunity to reflect on what is really important and necessary. I would like to thank this panel of experts, as well as those that will follow in the breakout sessions that we have put together with the support of Cal, Colex, JPlex, CalEx, ABCL, and BALEx for lending us their Saturday afternoon to explore what we can expect in the years to follow so our students can make better informed decisions about their future. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Professor Sanjay Sharma, who is the Vice President for Open Learning at MIT and serves on the board of organizations like edX that are at the forefront of digital learning. He will speak to us about the future of education, which is he is an authority on, as he has created a group that seeks to transform teaching and learning throughout the world through research, curriculum development, community building, and innovative learning offerings. Professor Sharma. Thank you so much, Manasi, and such a pleasure to see you all. I'll just speak for a few minutes about um, open learning and my office, but perhaps uh, frame it with a little bit of the science behind it. So the history is that MIT has done um, um, a lot of work in digital learning over the last uh, 20 years. But what people don't realize perhaps is that um, the work in digital learning was actually driven as much in an attempt to uh, transform residential learning as anything else. Um, and the question then is why? The founding principle of MIT was, is always been, uh, or it was, mens et manus, and it's always been something that runs through its, uh, its, uh, uh, its spirit, which is mind and hand, which is you do as much as you learn, um, action learning, learning by doing, um, and so on. Um, and uh, one of the challenges that we've had, both at MIT but in education worldwide, is this uh, shift towards lectures. And what I want to talk about now is how uh, the science of learning and how um, uh, technology, online learning has uh, led, a led, it, led to a transformation in this, uh, in this space. So you see, if you look at uh, the science of learning and I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer, actually the neuroscientist in this, in this group is, uh, is Fatih Kiran, whose son Sid is on this panel and is doing some tremendous work with Helm, which is an online learning platform he and others have developed. 
But as a mechanical engineer, let me just tell you that about 10 years ago, I was asked to help MIT build a university in Singapore, Singapore University of Technology and Design. And what engineers do is we go to scientists and say, tell us what the science of learning is, and we'll reverse it and build an institution that achieves what the science tells us we ought to achieve. Now, as I got into this, over the years, I began to realize that our educational uh, dogmas are sort of stuck about 100 years uh, ago. It's sort of like uh, medicine to some extent before you know, genetics and biochemistry and uh, before we understood, uh, um, you know, before even x-rays. And if you look at how learning actually occurs, and this is uh, the evidence from neuroscientists, um, and you think about how, for example, memories form, how uh, uh, forgetting plays a critical part in, uh, in the formation of memories, you begin to realize that our approach to learning, which is these one way, you know, 20%, 40% person, 100%, 150% lectures are not actually compatible with the way the human being learns. The way a human being really learns is by formulating a model of the world. Um, the, you know, there's a fundamental dogma in the way we teach, which is convenient, but happens not to be correct, which is that the student's mind is a sheet of paper and the teacher has a pen. And all the teacher has to do is write on that sheet of paper and declare victory and the student is ready to go. And in that dogma, our approach is you can wag a finger at the student and say, you're not paying attention. You're not listening. You're not remembering. But the actual science tells us that what the student is doing is the student has agency and the student is formulating a model of the world. And it's like a plant growing. You give the plant water when the plant wants water. You give the plant sunlight when the plant wants sunlight, potassium, nitrogen. In fact, there's a whole field that's called precision agriculture. Um, similarly, when a human being is formulating a model of the world, whether a child or an adult, you need to feed that model as the model requires information, as the model requires coaching, as the model requires reinforcement, and as the model requires physical re uh, uh, reinforcement. The problem is that uh, that is inconvenient. Um, and so what we have over the last 200 years done, and to some extent going back to the Industrial Revolution, has created this model where you sit students down, and you declare, you know, as a professor, I can tell you, you lecture for 45 minutes, lecture for an hour, and declare victory. And that is not working. Um, actually, uh, if you take the formation of memories all the way to the synapses, it turns out that when you learn something for the first time, uh, you can actually take input for about 10 minutes, chunks for 10 minutes, um, and then you get distracted. Um, once you take an input, uh, shorter memories formed but long-term memory doesn't naturally form until you begin to forget it and it gets reinforced. I'm, I'm, I'm approximating a little bit to give you the idea. Um, so in fact, forgetting turns out to be an important part in learning. Um, we know, for example, there's this concept of interleaving. If you learn, for example, how to calculate the volume of a sphere or the volume of a cone, you're better off interleaving problems, sphere, cone, sphere, cone, sphere, cone, rather than sphere, 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 cone, cone, cone. Now, the problem is, um, every textbook and every lecture is the lecture on spheres, the lectures on the lecture on cones. We don't need to be, and all these things are these fundamental, you know, psychological truths that we ignore in the one-way lecture where we go forty-five minutes on spheres, and if the student doesn't get it, we say it's your problem. Now, now that we're beginning to understand um, how the brain actually forms memories, how we learn, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, do we have the gumption? Do we have the strength? Do we have the commitment to rethink the classroom? Well, what's happened is students have found another way. It's happening naturally. So what have students done? Students have gone to, you know, started creating lectures. That's how Khan Academy was formed. That's how Vaiha, that's how Three Blue, One Brown, that's how Minute Physics, that's how Crash Course History, and all these YouTube channels have begun to emerge because it's young people saying, I'm going to produce content the way I would like it. Now, when that happens, what a, a learner can do is go to these other media, and listen to the content. If it goes too fast, they can pause it. If it's going too slowly, they can listen to, to, to at speed. They, if they begin to forget it, which they naturally will, they can go back and re-watch it. Um, it's usually in 10 minute chunks, which is more compatible with the way we learn. And this is a huge thing, uh, the huge movement. And the reason it's taking off is fundamentally because that's actually preferable. If you then embrace this online movement, then what do you do in the classroom? Well, there's another set of uh, 
results. Um, there's a beautiful book on this topic by, the, by a cognitive neuroscientist by the name of um, Anders Ericsson, who passed away, unfortunately, two or three months ago. It's called Peak, the Science of Expertise. And what it talks about is a approach called deliberate practice and how anyone with good coaching by doing real projects, by having someone stand over their shoulder and give them instruction on how to do it better can become a world expert. Um, in Anders Ericsson's book, he talks about, for example, perfect pitch, which is the ability to recognize and reproduce a note perfectly. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was thought to have it and was seen as a God-given gift. But what the Japanese showed only recently was with methods like the Suzuki method, you can actually, by coaching at a very young age, give a lot more students perfect pitch, something like 10, 20%. So it's not like this once in a lifetime God-given uh, gift. It is something that you can coach. And so we're beginning to understand the power of coaching. We're beginning to understand something called embodied cognition, which is how when you do something with your hand, you learn better, you remember better. We're learning, for example, how um, when you go, uh, for example, on a field trip, your memory is more vivid. So this combination is what is called, and many of you know this, called the flipped classroom. So the idea is you displace the lecture to the online content, and the classroom becomes a flipped classroom where you're actually doing things and doing the things that you can only do in person. So the tragedy is really that we are in a place where we do the things in the classroom that you can actually do better online today, right? We waste it on lectures. We don't apply any of these cognitive tricks that I described to you. You can do a 10 minute class. You can only do a 45 minute class because it takes 10 minutes to settle people down. So we go for 45 minutes. We violate all the principles. And the things we don't do in the classroom are the things that actually really matter. One of the great joys of Lexington High School and like the Lexington school system is the teachers are very evolved. My mother, who was a teacher in India, um, she came and volunteered when, when um, my own kid was young in the school system. And she said, here, they actually do a lot more of that. That's amazing. So Lexington, we're very blessed. But the future of education is this done at massive scale. And COVID-19 is going to wake us up to this. Let me speak a little bit about COVID and I'll talk about what MIT is doing. So COVID has forced us into, I think, the worst of both worlds. A lot of classrooms around the world were socially distanced to, to begin with. In other words, the professor, the teacher would stand in front, the professors are sitting in, in the classroom and the teacher is talking. And when we went to COVID, we just took that to Zoom. So we went from socially distance learning to socially distance learning without even the little joys and the li little uh, uh, pleasures of being in person. The right way to do online is to actually create asynchronous videos and have the students consume it at their own pace. Of course, it takes a change of culture. And when you do do the Zoom lecture, make it interactive and sort of flip the classroom in Zoom. And when we come back to the regular classroom, hopefully you can do a lot more. Because if when COVID ends, we recreate what we're doing with Zoom lectures, except we're back in person, it would be a terrible shame. And this is the philosophy behind the um, flipped classroom. So I'm hoping that we come, we come back, wake up from COVID and come back to reality, that we come back to a better reality. We, we do not recreate the Zoom classrooms and stare at each other, except we're staring at each other in person, not through a camera and a screen. Um, and we rethink what the classroom is all about. I hope when nature grants back to us the luxury, the privilege, the joy of being in person, we really take advantage of it and not do what we're doing today in Zoom. Zoom has simply exposed us to the possibilities and I hope we learn from it. So, um, so what is the future of education? Well, the summary is that when you have all this online content, what's gonna happen is a massive explosion of certificates, badges. Um, you could, and, and a huge set of new modalities. So for example, Sid is a student at Michigan. Let's say that uh, a young student at Michigan studying engineering wants to learn about, I don't know, uh, cryptocurrencies because there is no course offered that the student can take uh, in their, in their uh, uh, day because it's, you know, their regular classes um, keep them busy. Well, wouldn't it be great if the student could take an online course in cryptocurrency? And wouldn't it be great if they could get a certificate? Wouldn't it be even better that certificate could show up on their uh, transcript 
So what we need to do here is fundamentally rethink the transcript, rethink the delivery modalities and rethink the value of these certificates. And this is gonna happen. It's already started happening at MIT. We have something called open courseware, which is 20 years old. We have more than a, we've had more than 150 million unique users, 500 million people show up. Then we created MITx, we created edX, MIT and Harvard invested. edX has crossed hundred million enrollments out of which 4 million are MIT alone, uh, unique. Um, and so what's happening is that we are seeing a massive move to the online. A lot of people ask me, well, doesn't that make the residential education bit um, less attractive? Why would people do residential education? Well, I say that's a challenge. I say that's a good question to ask and you should ask the question. And residential education has to change to do the things I talked about, the projects, the teamwork, the uh, coaching, the mentoring, the field trips, the international trips, et cetera. And that is the transformation we're gonna see. Final comment, <clears throat> I've talked about younger people. What about older adults? What about, you know, someone like me? Well, um, you know, I'm a professor, I do engineering. Um, and I have to say that in my field, stuff I knew 10 years ago is completely out of date. And as a professor, of course, I'm continuously learning and doing research, but I, uh, I know a lot of colleagues in Lexington and um, in, in, you know, in the United States, around the world. And what I'm finding and what I predict will happen is every one of us, you know, is going to get on the learning treadmill from now until we retire and perhaps after. And what I mean by that is, imagine if I said to you, listen, you just need to work out for the first four years of your life you would be fit for the rest of your life. You never have to go to a gym again. That's sort of the educational contract we have today. You know, you get your undergraduate, master's, PhD degree, and you're set. But the reality is, today, we will all have to go to the gym, the education gym, which is likely online, um, two to three times a day, a, a, a week, just to stay abreast. It's going to be that, you know, it's like your uh, health. It's your career health. And maybe once in six months, you go and do a boot camp where you've learned you know, machine learning, but you're doing a hackathon with a bunch of students. So education, which my final comment is um, very monolithic. Is it gonna become granular? Is it gonna become multimodal? And it's gonna become continuous. I actually think it'll hit uh, working adults first, and eventually it's gonna filter down to all levels of education, down to the level of a student doing an undergrad wanting to learn a skill that, you know, his school or his school might not offer um, and perhaps down to high school as well. And we're already seeing that. So I know that we've run a little bit over time, but I just want to stop here and thank you again. It's such a pleasure to speak to my uh, wonderful friends and um, uh, acquaintances and fellow parents here in uh, Lexington. And with that, back to you, Manasi. Okay. Thank you so much, Sanjay. It's wonderful to hear. And as a teacher myself, I'm really excited about a lot of the information that you shared. Okay, so um, we're going to move on to the question portion. So we have collected some questions from the community. So we have some questions we're going to start off posing. And then if the audience has additional questions, please send it to us in the chat. Um, and we will work to pose those to our panelists. So the first question I had is, there might be some mis mis misconceptions and stereotypes uh, about your fields that can be barriers to students choosing to pursue them. In your own words, how would you describe the work that you do, why you love it, and the impact it has let you have? So I'm going to begin with asking um, Michelle Sicolo, who is our state representative in Massachusetts, um, to speak about this, because as we know, politics has obviously gotten a pretty uh, bad name recently. So if you could share a little bit about your experience. Thanks so much, Mansi. I'm really thrilled to be here today, and I really appreciate IAL and um, Cary Library for hosting this incredible uh, seminar for our students and our young people to help them in guiding them in their careers. Um, you know, politics certainly has an absolutely bad rap, and it's interesting to me when I reflect on my career and where I've come from, how much, um, how different it is when you actually work in the field of government and policy. And I think people often confuse the two and consider that there is no path forward if you want to serve um, unless you run for office. And actually, I would argue that um, we, the, the more satisfying part of um, service can often be in government administration. 
and uh, just share a little bit about how I got into the field and uh, that might be helpful to folks considering that they might wanna go into government. So I graduated with an, an undergraduate degree in liberal arts. Um, I had multiple majors and had no idea that I was even interested in government when I graduated. Didn't know what I wanted to do and was encouraged to um, go and intern um, and become an intern. And I actually uh, served in uh, then US Senator John Kerry's office as my very first internship out of college, which uh, led to a paid position within his office. And from there, um, I began to realize how interesting in government service is and um, did go on to get a master's degree in the field. And I think that can be helpful for students um, you know, once they've actually had some work experience, I really encourage young people to first try uh, working in, in the field that they're interested in. Um, so local government is the area that I served in primarily for 25 years before uh, running for higher office. And that is also an area that I think is really overlooked uh, in terms of government service. And I will say that I find it the most rewarding field because it's so tangible. When you work in local government, you actually get to see the things you build, the things that you create, the policies that you implement. Whereas if you were to say, go into the federal government, it may be um, a very long time before you see policy changes. It's, um, it's much less concrete and much more theoretical. So for people who think that they might be interested in exploring a career in government, I strongly encourage you to look at local government as a, as a first um, entry gateway, um, and even as a lifetime long career, because it is very, very satisfying and very tangible. You meet the people you're going to help. You know them one, you know, one on one, um, face to face. You uh, you really see the um, the impact of your work. So um, again, thank you for having me here today, and I'm uh, looking forward to answering additional questions on the panel. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, Dr. Wei. Uh, would you mind um, answering? Okay, so um, I think uh, for computer science, when people are talking about computer science, uh, they probably think about computer science is just about programming. And actually this is only for the entry level jobs. So computer science is actually more on the problem solving. And also because computer science has been used to solve problems, to serve people. So there is a significant human side to computer science as well. And then computer science is also about uh, cross-cutting technologies. So we we'll often have to work with domain scientists, domain experts uh, to help the society to make a broader impact. So I do encourage students, uh, if you cannot just solely major in computer science, you may have other interests and passion. I do encourage students to choose computer science as a minor or a double major, especially for women students. I spend lots of my time in, you know, in my spare time to help middle school female students and high school students to uh, get them involved with computer science as early as possible. So it's not just about you do programming at the garage or at the basement. It's more about how you can use your computer science skills to help the society and also help the community. And also one thing I would mention is uh, I work with Cal to set up a computer science youth team. So then a group of high school students use their computer science skills to help the communities and, and also help the nonprofit organizations in Lexington. So they just accomplished their first project. So they helped the Harrington Elementary School build up a new website. So those uh, seven high school students. So I would like to, and also I'm currently working at the National Science Foundation to, uh, so my job is involved with AI related research. So for students or any audience has questions on artificial intelligence, machine learning, data mining, uh, feel free to ask me during the panel session. And then thank you so much for having me here for this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Isabel, would you like to share? Yes, hi everyone, I'm Isabel Calofonos. I am actually talking to you from Switzerland today, from Zurich. I, I used to live in Lexington for many years and I work in the pharmaceutical industry. So the pharmaceutical industry actually has so many fields. And you know, if you think about just the recent uh, COVID outbreak and the idea that we were able to develop vaccines in a record time, um, 
it took a significant effort by many people. So I encourage you to think about if you like biology and you really like to understand how the body works and you really wanna help you know, find new medicines and transform the way that we look at you know, our body, uh, the society and, and healthcare, this is a great area to consider. Also, if you are really good at, in analytics and you want to study statistics or you wanna, you are very good at writing and you wanna be a medical writer to really help us uh, you know, communicate the benefits and also prepare the filings with the different regulatory authorities across the world. And in my particular job, I work in strategy and marketing and I had the opportunity to really learn about the healthcare in many, many countries. For me, it's very important to continue learning. So it's a job that had inspired me in that way. Also, because I work in rare diseases, genetic diseases that normally affect very few people in the world, and that is really hard to find a solution. I had had the chance to meet many of those patients. And when we are able to find a cure that many times takes many years, it is really rewarding to see that you are able to transform not only the life of that patient, but the life of the family of that patient. So I had found that you need to work in something that inspires you, something that you feel passionate about, something where you feel like you can give back to society and, and at the same time use your skills. So I had found that uh, working in this industry with a very large group of people, scientists, PhDs, um, statistics, as I mentioned before, so many specialties working together to bring these medicines together forward has been really impressive to me. And uh, I will add that, you know, always try to find, you know, things that for me that inspire you. And, you know, learning is one of those things. And in this industry, you are constantly learning. Our body it has so many cells and so many ways that we can, you know, have um, a condition, cancer, COVID, and this uh, career in my, in my mind has been very fulfilling. Um, a last uh, point that I will mention is I started my career actually in consulting after I studied engineering and entrepreneurship. And that also was great because I was able to look at many industries before making my final choice. So I hope that helps you. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you so much, Isabel. Okay, so Satvik. Hey y'all, uh, my name is Satvik Alawalia. I'm coming to you from Austin, Texas, though I was a 08 uh, LHS alum. Uh, I really miss Lexington right now because it's kind of hot here and I heard y'all got snow. So a little bit jealous. Um, I'm going to talk, talk about this a little bit differently. I work in politics right now. I run digital strategy for a statewide uh, nonprofit here in Texas, but I've lived a lot of different lives. I, I did. A, I had a startup. I've worked in tech. Um, I've, I've run for office. Actually, Michelle and I ran for the same seat in 2014, which was a lot of fun. Um, what, I, what, I, what I would want to say to you is the world that we live in right now, attention is really, really valuable, right? Like if you've ever been on TikTok, you know that there's one second for someone to pay attention to you. Um, and that's not just for social media, that's in all parts of our lives. So what I would say is like, be passionate about what you do, but really learn to tell a story. Um, if you're looking for someone to invest in you, whether it's to build a company or to, or to donate to your campaign, you need to tell a story. If you wanna create a digital brand, you need to tell a story. And so along with any other skills that you might have, and I know on this panel, we have researchers, we have computer scientists, we have people who've worked in local in a you know, public office, you need to develop that skill, but you also need to learn how to tell a story because that is gonna become very, very valuable as we move forward. Um, the other thing I would say is take time to make friends in things that you don't do. Um, my best friends are in medicine and they're in uh, real estate and they're in computer sciences, things that I know nothing about. But what that allows me to do is get varying perspectives on, perspectives on what's going around the world, but also, it gives me opportunities to do things I would never get to do if I only hung out with people who were in politics. And as someone like Michelle, you, I'm sure you can say the same thing. When you work in just one field for too long, and a lot of the people you meet are in that network, you hear the same things over and over again. The ideas begin to confirm themselves for you, confirmation bias. So try and expose yourself to as many kinds of people doing as many kinds of things. Um, and what you'll find is a lot of really beautiful projects will come out of that. And your life will feel a lot richer 
um, because you know all those kinds of folks. Thanks. Thank you, Sathik. Um, Amar. Yeah, I'll uh, try to, uh, I, I know that you got a few different questions. Uh, so the question that I think that at hand was uh, about uh, misconceptions of our uh, field and uh, what work do we do and what impact it has. So uh, with regards to that, I think I work in the med tech and uh, biopharma industry. Uh, and the misconception I think people have is that uh, pharma is price gouging and, uh, you know, it's uh, unethical and over prescription and things of that nature. Uh, which uh, I would say, you know, is uh, not globally true. Uh, there are always, as then you feel, some bad actors. Uh, and, the, you know, the pharma bro, for example, uh, that some of you might have heard of, Martin Schrecker, really, uh, give people a bad name. Uh, however, uh, I think uh, the field, by and large, is made up of people who are ethical and motivated trying to solve problems. So what motivates me? Uh, so I got started in the entrepreneurial uh, side of things. Uh, I'm a chemical engineer myself, uh, did my bachelor's in India and then did my master's and doctorate work at, uh, in Texas. And then moved over here because some of my work in my dissertation was turning into uh, a couple of companies. One was being started in Kendall Square and I came here. Uh, so from that time, uh, which was uh, back in uh, 80, uh, 92 to now, I've been uh, starting companies. Um, and many of these have uh, actually relied on some of those foundational learnings that I did as a chemical engineer working in biomaterials of doing chemistry inside the body, basically being able to transform materials inside the body to be able to address a number of uh, tissue healing applications, preventing scar, uh, preventing leakage from tissues, uh, local drug delivery. So there have been a series of companies that have solved these uh, problems and many of them have gone on to become kind of leading products, uh, you know, how, they, how the brain is closed to prevent uh, leakage from cerebral spinal fluid to after angioplasty, how uh, the femoral artery is closed um, how um, uh, after prostate cancer uh, radiation therapy to minimize damage, uh, how to replace eye drops uh, with a single uh, placement of uh, a depot. So all these are inventions which have turned into real products that actually help over uh, a million patients every year. So it gives me great satisfaction to see that I've been able to participate in that and participate in the value chain. Um, what is really important over here is to be able to look for problems around you. I think uh, overall as uh, um, somebody who uh, pays attention to the world around you, uh, look and see where the problems are. Uh, we can either take an attitude of complaining about the problems that exist, or actually for an entrepreneur, those are all opportunities. Those are opportunities to make a difference. Those are opportunities to see what you could do and how you could solve and find similarly motivated people with complementary skill sets. Same value systems, but complementary skill sets form a team. And that's how entrepreneurial efforts get started. Find a few people who might believe in you, who want to invest in you, maybe your friends and family. And once you create a great solution and you work diligently towards it, you will find that you can chart your own course. So don't wait for somebody else to come in and give you a job. If you find, because you know, I came in as an immigrant and uh, after my master's, I applied to 30 different companies and didn't have a green card. So I got rejected by 30 different companies. Uh, and I could have sat there and moped and complained about discrimination and these types of things, or I did something about it. I got educated more and I figured out how to create a job for myself. And after that, I've never worked for anybody else. And it's actually turned out to be a very satisfying uh, uh, life. So I would just uh, say that, you know, don't be afraid of taking control of your own. With the day and age that we live in, where knowledge is available freely uh, and people can communicate across the globe, uh, this is a perfect setup to be able to define your own fate. Thank you so much, Amar. Uh, Sam? Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, and at the same time, I would like to share that uh, my background is pretty diverse. One of the things that uh, I never knew I would end up in defense field, but I come back. I come from India in mining engineering, of course. Uh, after at the tail end, I figured that I don't like it. So luck for me that uh, I was able to come to the United States to join the family, went, did my electrical engineering and uh, ultimately uh, liked the computers more. But what I like to share with the students and uh, anybody out, out in the world, please find your passion. There are many things you do well or look around what you do well. Be a, even if you are a middle uh, school student, high school student, college student, or any, anyone who wants to be a student, who wants to learn something, find your passion 
And if you say, well, I'm in the middle school, I don't know what my passion, because in my middle school, I didn't know anything, what I, what I, what I like to do. That's fine. But start paying attention what you do well. Be as a mathematics, physics, chemistry, history, English, cultural, anything you like, you do well, or you, you are more interested in finding much and much. Please go into that one and assess your own capability. I, you, if you say, well, you know, I'm not good at assessing myself. Simple measures are look at your report cards. If you do well, you would know. If you don't, you will know. Keep going and find that uh, where you want to end up or where you want to start from. As a matter of fact, none of us know where we're going to end up because we are constantly learning every day as what things we don't like or what we are more curious about and few things that we don't like, why we want to uh, look into it. Maybe for curiosity, new field, anything. Well, just to share with you that um, after coming out of electrical engineering, I was more interested in computers and computer networks. And lucky for me, I found an opportunity as a co-op job that took me there. And within the computer networks, I found out that, no, 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 there is a much, much more to it. And uh, once you, uh, and I had passion to learn more and as much, I got all the trainings that companies and uh, even back then, small, the internet was pretty budding. Uh, and uh, I've been to the, those uh, BBNs, if you ever remember anybody with the Hayes modems logging on to those. Point is, uh, keep exploring and keep pushing to see what you really would enjoy working at. That's number one. At the middle, middle school level, high school, college, anywhere, what would you be, what would like to work on? Once you discover, it's a much more self-discovery that will take you far as opposed to uh, somebody telling you what you really should be doing. My interpretation about your skills is simply a measure of what I see outside or what I can gauge from objectively from all the um, report cards or any other conversation we can have. But ultimately, deep down, if you, have a, if you are developing a passion, curiosity will take you to the passion. If you don't have it, start looking around what you like to do, what problem you want to solve, which field today sounds exciting, or well, what about tomorrow or 10 years from now? I don't know. Well, well here's the thing. Even the best uh, pottery makers, even they are in demand today, no matter Today is 2020 and people wants to be in computers and artificial intelligence and any complicated field you can think of it, they are ex excelling. But the question is that what you are passionate about. Well, some people say, well, um, you know, I am still finishing up. I have, I'm foggy. It's okay. Allow yourself that time. Ponder. Take uh, lonely walks. I've done it. It helps. Again, this is the mechanism by which I self-discovered myself where I would be or where I would like to be. And from that point on, luck has it, sometimes strange things happen in life. You get small opportunity and you create a window. And from that window, you open the doors. It's, that's how it's done, at least for me. So I'm in defense field. I've seen and worked on projects where cyber security is one of the key. And of course, working with federal government, cyber security is one of the key because around the world, everyone wants what you do. The research you have come up with, and of course, uh, many other things that uh, the planet is interested in what US government is involved in. Okay, that's one thing. Outside in the field, Anywhere where there is information converted into a digital form, you would be valuable. Your, risk, uh, your attention, your expertise, your experience would be valuable. Think in those terms. So with that, um, I'll give you a little bit of my current uh, work. Uh, basically, I'm allowed to say very little about what I do, but I can tell you that uh, I work with the MIT Lincoln Lab in Lexington and from the Air Force point of view, 
and the things that I see, the research work, research work I've seen, you wouldn't believe what they do and what they can come up with and how long they've been doing it. So think about the pinnacle of your career. You could wind up in places you could be proud yourself, your family, and anyone that uh, who who think highly of you. With that, uh, I'll I'll just go quiet and uh, wait for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, Abhijit. Hi, Mansi. Thank you for having me on the panel. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Abhijit. I'm a computer scientist. I've been studying computer science and working with computers for uh, 40 years now, uh, the first 13 in school until I got a PhD in computer science. And then uh, for 27 years uh, working in different industries, starting with the software industry and then uh, the financial in industry for the bulk of my career, and then uh, the media industry in the last uh, you know five or six years. And I've been working with uh, large amounts of data uh, for all my life, uh, as far as back as I can remember, computer science. Um, uh, the current wave of AI is actually the third um, wave, as I um, call it. And the first one was when I was a child, I didn't even know about it. But when I was in college, I was right in the middle of the second wave of AI. That's what I wanted to study in college. But once I was in grad school, I changed my mind. Uh, and that's actually what I wanted to talk to you about briefly. What we're living through right now is uh, data-driven AI. Uh, it's you know, a different kind of AI from the first uh, and the second waves where there wasn't uh, this amount of data or uh, computing power to deal with it. Uh, but one thing that has been true of all three waves that there's a lot of hype. The people say AI will do this, AI will do that, but you have to watch out. You, it's not to say I don't want to discourage you from getting into the field, but be true to yourself. Look at things um, honestly, trust your own judgment. If it doesn't make sense to you, it probably doesn't make sense. Uh, so go full steam into computers and data and AI, uh, certainly they're changing the world and they'll continue to do so. Uh, but uh, be wary of uh, all the hype that you that you hear about, about these things. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Jensher. Um, hi, yeah, hopefully I'm coming through, good. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm in a somewhat different field. I'm a physician and um, specifically pediatric endocrinologist. Um, probably the main disadvantage of the field is that it takes forever to train in. Um, do an undergraduate degree, um, medical school, residency, fellowship. I did a PhD as well, too. Um, I just totaled that up. It's about 16 years of training, um, which is a little more. <laughs> uh, but on the flip side, you get into a profession that um, gives you a lot of opportunities, different specialties, um, can give you um, different areas, things to do. And, um, and just a sign of really how much people enjoy doing, how great it is, is, is really it's a profession no one ever really retires from. Um, that it, it, it's so fulfilling to be doing it in, and on a daily basis. Most of my day um, is involved with interacting with other people, um, that uh, it's a lot of direct patient interaction, a lot of conversations, um, trying to figure out how to employ a lot of the tools that are coming from um, colleagues that we just heard from, uh, from the pharmaceutical and, and, and likewise and bio biotech, um, to be able to actually um, for that individual that's sitting in front of you, what, what can you do best to help them? And uh, very fulfilling. Um, it's a lot of people interaction. So um, if you like talking to folks and talking to different folks uh, throughout the course of the day, it's, it's a great profession to, uh, uh, to look at. Um, and um, I, I would encourage you to, um, to, uh, to take a look and uh, ask questions and breakout if, you, if you'd like to hear more. Thank you so much. Okay, so we had a live question um, about uh, for um, Isabel about how do you see the pharmaceutical industry regarding hiring people from different states, public and private universities, and with or without PhD? Hi, yes, hi Patricia. Well, uh, I can say that the pharmaceutical industry is actually hiring from many states as well as people with different degrees, and it depends on the job that you are looking to do. Yes. So uh, I encourage uh, people to consider an internship to really see it. And we offer normally in the summer 
many opportunities in, in science, in marketing, in strategy. We totally open internships in many of the companies in the pharmaceutical industry right now. And Boston is a place where it has so many from the small ones to the big ones um, in that. In terms of the level of education, if for, for our discovery groups, we are normally looking for a master of a PhD because you really need to have that deep knowledge of biology and understanding or, or chemistry or, uh, to really be able to discover these new medications. In other fields in, in, the, in the industry, it's okay to just be undergraduate and you know, jump into the industry and see if you like or not. There is program management job, there is medical writing, there's statistics, there is marketing um, or strategy where you don't need to necessarily have um, a PhD. It helps to have sometimes a master's for certain jobs, um, but you can be uh, from a public university, you can be from a private university. Uh, there is actually a lot of variety for that. Uh, something else that the pharmaceutical industry offers that some of you might be interested in is sometimes we have global rotations. Of course, right now in COVID, it's not exactly like that, but you are able to, to initiate your job and do rotations and change departments. Start three months in finance, three months in marketing, three months in science, and you can get a better idea if that's what, which area you'd like to do more. Um, you know, sometimes if you are more of a really focused, shy person, maybe you just wanna be in the lab, and concentrate on your projects. If you are a person who likes more interaction and wants to be working with the agency who is doing the commercial and is going to be, you know, going to be more creative, maybe you want to be more in the marketing side or the strategy side. So there are many career opportunities within this industry that you can consider. Um, there are some uh, members of the team that are really analytical and also working in different. Um, and models to to better understand uh, things so it, it really offers opportunities across all of that but i will summarize some of the things that we had said so far in the panel for me three important things for you to consider you have to be passionate about what you do uh, that's very important you need to have self-awareness what is it that you feel that you're really good at and what do you want to do in the future do you like to interact with people? You don't like to interact with people. You are really good at certain things. And the third thing is that be prepared that things are constantly evolving. The way that the industry was 20 years ago in the pharma industry is not the way it's going to be five years from now, 10 years from now. We are changing. You know, the skill set is changing. You know, you, you, you need to be adaptive. You need to be um, willing to constantly learn because, you know, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, we didn't have the technology tools that we have today to capture data, to better advance science, you know, to better understand um, how to do our job. And so for me, those are three things that you have to consider as you choose the career path that you want to follow. Thank you so much, Isabel. Okay, so that segues very well into our next question, which is, looking to the future in the next five to 10 years, what do you see happening, especially in the wake of how your industry has been impacted by COVID. Okay, so um, I did want to hear from some of the people we haven't heard from yet. So Professor Anil Segal, could you talk a little bit about how the college uh, landscape has changed in reaction to COVID and how you, what type of changes do you anticipate continuing and uh, what might return back after, once we get back to some form of normal? Thank you, Mansi. It's a uh... Pleasure to be part of this panel and take this uh, question up. As everybody here has experienced, especially people who are in the universities and school systems, uh, COVID has made a major impact and uh, uh, going to online learning. And that was always something the world of education used to worry, was slow to change, but COVID came with a bang and uh, basically took everyone sort of by surprise and globally, uh, everybody went to online education within a span of probably, I would say a week, uh, literally. But what that has done is uh, it has, uh, 
now after about six months of solid data all over the world, uh, we have learned a lot from it. So what have we learned? At least uh, let me put from the perspective uh, in higher education uh, at a university, I teach uh, mechanical engineering at Tufts University. So as you all know, this happened in March and uh, in fall, uh, Tufts decided to give students the opportunity to actually take the courses online um, and not return to campus or return to campus and uh, take it either uh, online or in a hybrid mode. Everybody was worried that nobody would come back and uh, we were one of the very few universities, you can count them in hand, which actually opened the fall semester for 100% of the students to return back to campus. And 92% of the students actually returned back to campus. What they mentioned and what we have seen why they returned back to campus was basically uh, yes, with all the social distancing and following all the masks and everything, they really like to work in groups. They just could not see them taking these courses from uh, home all by themselves. What uh, we have seen sort of was my uh, philosophy. I was sort of uh, on the other side. so. A lot of people are here from India and uh, there's a university in Bombay called SND University, which is a women's college. And they have been offering sort of correspondence course for the last 50 years. This was for people working women, uh, women who are busy at home, they could do things from home. Only so many people register, people still like to go to the university. Um, so we as, People, we like uh, to work in groups. We like to be with fellow people. Yes, it is great to upgrade skill sets as we talked about for people who are working in industry, but for the initial education, there's still a lot of research to be done and we'll see after a year, if in the last two, three days, you have looked at the announcements from Duke and other places in terms of early admissions, early applications, they are all up to record levels, uh, more than 10% to 15% at most of the schools. So which way we are going, I think is still debatable. Uh, the other thing which I would just like to add is we keep talking about these modules that we make in 10 minutes uh, uh, things. Uh, 10 minute segments. It is, uh, there's now, I think a lot of research coming out both in the world of educational technology and other side, what does, what it does in terms of long-term uh, uh, benefits and disadvantages. People have a hard time concentrating more than uh, 10 minutes at a time. Uh, things which even relate to other fields where theater, I need to be able to uh, memorize, get a good feel before I can do a play, uh, the, uh, whether it's theater, dance, all these places, this 10 minute segments are starting to make an impact. What it will be in the long run, we'll wait and see, but these six months have really taught us a lot. And we just did a survey, we expect more than 90% uh, to return back to campus uh, even in the spring for Tufts. So the, between mental health, working in group, um, the way the education is delivered to be able to, as uh, Professor Sharma said, we like to build things. All that is sort of in some ways lost when we try to do things completely online. So a lot has changed, but I think it will be a long time in my opinion, that's just me talking, where for upgrading skill sets online is great, but for other things, given what we now know, it will uh, take time before we mentally change and decide we are motivated enough to learn and do everything on our own.
Thank you so much. Um, next, I'd like to call on Catherine. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so to give a little background about my field, so I'm a second year grad student at Columbia School of Social Work. And so my field per se and my background, is, I'm currently a social work intern at Safe Passage Project. Um, it's based in New York, but I'm currently in Lexington. Um, and Safe Passage Project is a legal service organization working with unaccompanied minors. And so COVID has definitely impacted so in so many different ways. And one of the main ways, especially with the young people I'm working with has been mental health. Um, so the young people I work with are, you know, unaccompanied minors, so they're crossing from the border and there's a lot of, you know, different traumatic experience that happen regarding that on top of just trying to live every day as being a young person, um, trying to navigate school, trying to navigate home life and just every day. And so my, I, my main task is, has been trying to connect resources and do check-ins with these youth, as well as, um, you know, yeah, just check in with them and connect them to like ther to the therapy. And so as being um, a young person who may not, whose first language is not English, trying to connect them to therapists who, uh, whose like language is, is what matches with them is so crucial, but unfortunately in the mental health field, you know, there aren't a lot of um, therapists who speak other languages, right? There's not a lot of therapists who speak indigenous languages. So we, I have, I serve a lot of clients who come from like Central, excuse me, Central America, who's, who are from like Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, but then are from the indigenous parts, right? And there aren't a lot of therapists who serve that communities. Any and also there's still a lack of therapists who are within the BIPOC community, black indigenous people of color. And so it has been my like commitment and goal in trying to um, serve and trying to find resources to help them as well as advocate, you know, making sure that their needs are being met. And so, yeah, I think that's one of the main ways that COVID has uh, definitely impacted that as well as just delays in terms of like connecting different resources and trying to get in contact with different organizations. Thank you so much. Okay, so next I wanted to pose, um, what can students do in middle, high school, and even college to explore and figure out um, what field is right for them? Um, and I did wanna first, and also just like what activities they can do. So I wanted to first um, start with Siddharth who hasn't spoken yet. He's a recent alumni of LHS. Hey, honestly, thank you so much. And thank you for organizing this. Um, so as, she, as Manasi mentioned, I am a recent alumni of LHS. I graduated back in May, and I'm now an uh, undergraduate at the University of Michigan studying aerospace engineering. Um, so when I was in high school, I, there were really two things that I did that I'm really proud of, and I, I wanted to, to just share briefly with you. The first thing that I did was something that I worked on in ninth grade. It was a, a device called Seeing for the Blind, which was a, a project that I just kind of wanted to work on myself. I felt passionate about it and I felt that it needs to be done. So it's basically a pair of glasses that uses echolocation and machine learning, and it helps blind people navigate their way. And in ninth grade, I, I ended up seeing a problem, and I thought that there has to be a better solution to it. And like many things in the world, and you can go around and see it yourself, there are many things that simply don't make sense. And by looking at these problems, you can just figure out a better solution to it. And the only reason why it hasn't been done is because no one has gone enough and actually uh, took the action yet. And the thing is that you have the power to actually do that. So I thought that there is some, there's a, the, the issue of technology, assistive technology for blind people. That's a problem that not many people have really tried to improve because right now the technology is very rudimentary. So I decided to create a pair of glasses and experiment with that and try to get it to work so that blind people can really navigate the way with high tech uh, devices. So this is a project that I started in ninth grade and I worked on throughout high school. And then in, uh, in 11th grade, I was awarded a patent for it. And now I'm actually trying, uh, handing off the technology to a nonprofit to do uh, more work in India so that people there can actually be using the technology. Another problem that I, that I was working on was with my brother actually this past, um, this past spring. So there was this, as you know, many kids were out of school during COVID. And what I felt was really bad about that was that many kids end up getting inspired to go into different fields by really being in the classroom and learning about different fields of um, whether that's science or math or uh, English or liberal arts, they end up learning, that, learning and getting inspired by this in the classroom. I know I did, I am sure that many of you have as well. 
Now, the issue is if we're not in the classroom, we're not really getting that learning, how can we be inspired by certain fields? So my brother and I created something called Helm, where young um, high school students can teach basically small classes on stuff that they're passionate about. So for example, I taught something on Arduino technology and how to use small microcomputers. My brother taught something about uh, Python because he's very passionate about that. And we have many young kids going and teaching things that they really care about so that younger kids can learn this stuff and really be inspired by it. And that ended up starting back in April. And now we've reached around 3,000 students of enrollment. And we're continuing to grow in our offering classes, weekly classes every, every week in uh, certain, certain enrichment fields. Now, what I want you to take away from this is that you have the power to really go out there and do something. I, there, there's really no one out there that's stopping you except for yourself. And if you think about it, there's all these different things that you could possibly do. And, to, and now in the world that, given the world that Professor Sanjay Sarma was talking about earlier, where you can really go online and you can actually learn really anything or by just by watching these small 10 minute videos that are actually even better, that are even better than some other uh, large lectures. You can go outside and learn all these different things. And then you can take that knowledge and go and apply it to things that are, you are, you're really passionate about. So maybe you, you go and see a problem in the world that you think it needs to be solved. Maybe you see something that can actually go and help someone and change their life. You, you can take the technology, you can take the knowledge that you can learn outside in the world and you can apply it to building a solution that you can do and end up giving to someone or applying to some, some, to some problem and end up changing the way people end up living their lives. And I think that's a really powerful thing that you can do as a young person. And there's really no limit to it rather than just your uh, ability to go out there and really go and do it. So I encourage you all to go do that. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks, you, Siddharth. Uh, Michelle, do you have any thoughts to add on what younger students can do if they want to get into uh, public service? Absolutely. Um, there are many, many opportunities for young people to get involved on so many levels. Um, and I will just say that uh, conceptually, government is really about how people work together to set policy, to make decisions, to share resources, and to solve problems. And that goes on at every single level of our um, society, right down to really even within the home. And so when you think about it, uh, as a young person in middle school or high school can join a committee and, um, uh, sorry, my phone's ringing in the background. Um, people can uh, join a committee, they can volunteer um, in either a nonprofit organization or with their local government. Some of the things that I did um, along the way, and this was even before I knew that I was interested in government services, I was in class council at Lexington High School. And then when I went to college, I um, joined the student government and joined a committee and ended up being the chair of, a, of the student affairs division of the, um, the university government. Um, those are the kinds of things that are very readily accessible. But then even uh, right after college, um, I ran for town meeting. And that is something that anyone who is 18 years or older can do in the Lexington community um, if they're interested in trying to see what it's like to be in a legislative body. Um, and there are a wide range of internships, some of them paid, uh, many of them unpaid, but those are other opportunities that young people can do, um, to, can pursue uh, at any age, really. Um, there are campaigns that you could work on, and if you are specifically interested in the politics side of government, uh, someone in middle school could, could certainly work on a campaign, um, and in high school, absolutely. So one of the things I always tell people is don't be afraid to get involved. Don't be afraid to show up. Don't be afraid to use your voice. Um, if you're interested in something and um, you wanna pursue it, there are many, many committees that you could join. And in our local government in Lexington, we have probably a hundred committees on many different topics. So again, it's sort of finding what interests you the most and contacting the, uh, the, the town offices and contacting the chairs of the committee to see if they might be interested in having a young person work with them on that committee. So those are other things that they could do as well. But uh, I would just encourage folks to um, don't be afraid to, to get out there and try something. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wei. Hi, uh, so one thing I want to point out is for college students, especially if you are in the STEM major, you're in science and you know, technology and then uh, mathematics, all the things in the STEM. So it's quite important for you to get yourself involved with undergraduate research. So even you have the goal, you don't want to apply for graduate school, it does not matter at all. I still strongly encourage you to get involved with a research lab. 
So there are two different types of professors in the university. So some professors are very good at teaching. So those, you know, excellent. You learn those uh, the material in the class through the excellent teachers. So some professors, they may not be good at teaching at all, but they are excellent researchers. So don't look up down on the professors actually who are not good at teaching because you really have to think about those professors because they're so good at research. So they probably emphasize more on his own research labs on the new novel research ideas. And often for a major, the, the, you know, the novel ideas is actually from the professors who are very good at the research. So I want you to take advantage of those different type of professors. So professor good at teaching, they can get a good score from the class. Then for the professors who are good at the research, I would like you to reach out to the professors and talk to the professor, can I work in your research lab? Can I work with your PhD students? Can we work on some you know, new research paper together? And then for the NSF, uh, last year, so starting from last year, I began to organize the panels for graduate research fellowship. So for the National Science Foundation, we do provide fellowship for undergraduate students. So you, you actually can get uh, more than $30,000 per year for free provided by NSF. And one important factor for the panel to evaluate how good you are is whether you have been involved with research. So this is the thing I would like to get started as soon as possible. So get yourself with research. Even your goal is going to find a job in industry, but the research is going to give you the opportunities to learn the best part of this major. So this is what I want to say. Thank you, Isabel. Hi, yes, uh, I think, you know, I just would like to add that, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, was helpful for me uh, because I frankly didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, you know, is that I, I was asking a lot of people um, on the fields that I was interested. My parents had friends that were doctors, were lawyers, or some of them had uh, non-traditional careers, you know, were doing documentaries in, in movies. And, and it was really helpful to get the perspectives of what looks like a day in their careers, in their lives, how they got there. So, you know, participating in a panel like this is really helpful to give you ideas on how, you know, you wanna proceed about your career. And um, believe me, I don't think anyone really knows exactly in high school where they wanna go and how far they wanna go. So trying to start understanding yourself and exploring that is helpful. The other thing that I find that has been helpful that I didn't do, but um, we have uh, some students coming into my job and they shadow uh, what we do uh, in the lab, you know, or, or in research or in our session, we were coming up with new names for, for a product, a pharmaceutical product. We have a brainstorming session and we have a couple of students just participating and observing and, and learning and deciding if that was something they like to do or not. Um, of course, internships. Uh, when I was in college, I volunteered for a couple of um, projects with professors, you know, to see what they were doing is something I would like to do more, you know, um, cases in entrepreneurship in the food industry. I had never worked in the food industry. I wanted to understand more about how that was working and I participated on that or I also uh, did a project in banking, decided banking is not for me, uh, but I had the opportunity to, to work on that and discover that. So I encourage you to always try to, to listen, to learn and ask many questions. And if you had the opportunity to shadow someone in their daily job, um, once things get more normal with COVID, I, I think that's also very useful to really understand what a day looks like. And, Somebody was asking, is it very taxing to be a doctor because for eight years you have to study, you know? So you should be asking more people, how was the experience? How was uh, the process, you know? And how, how different fields, you know, feel and what kind of opportunities, life opportunities you have once you, you are in those fields. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, Safik. Hey all. Uh, so I work in digital communications uh, and I do it for a variety of different kinds of uh, spaces. This During this pandemic, um, for better or worse, my salary doubled because lots of organizations in, uh, you know, whatever they're doing, they had to pivot to talking to their audiences on digital spaces, Facebook, TikTok, the internet, whatever it is, right? Um, the beauty of this is that whatever you want to do, you want to become a doctor, you want to become a politician, you want to work in, you know, whatever it is, uh, 
you can do this, learning how to do digital marketing on the side, make money at whatever age you are. Like you can go into facebook.com right now and you can learn how to run Facebook ads. You can build a mini company on the side while you fund your own, uh, your, your next startup, right? This is a skill which is not gonna go anywhere. Um, it will be automated eventually, I think, but if you get to understand how to do it right now, you can control the automation in the future. Um, so, you know, it, it's really been an invaluable skill to me and all the other side products that I do in my day-to-day -day life. Um, it's honestly, not super complicated, but it seems super complicated. And it's really an easy way to get into really, for the most part, like any industry you wanna get into because you're understanding how to communicate and how to bring clients into whatever business that you, whatever sector you wanna be in, right? Like you need to bring people in to have a successful company and digital marketing is where a lot of that's gonna happen. Um, so if you want, uh, Monty, you can share my email afterwards. It's first name dot last name at gmail.com. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, it's been really great to see all of y'all. Thank you so much, Safik. Um, Amr, do you have anything to add about what students can do? Uh, I think um, what I would say for students to do, uh, you know, I, I can just rely on sort of what my kids are doing, for example, um, which is, uh, you know, they have been involved in the science uh, bowls and science competitions, and uh, they've been instrumental with my wife as, uh, you know, starting the science fair. So participate in your science fairs, uh, participate in self-driven projects. Um, so, um, you know, if you go to like my son's website on hadsani.com, you can see some of the projects that he's sort of made. Uh, uh, these are not been school curriculum kind of thing. It's just something that he's passionate about. Uh, he also did teach us class on circuit design to his uh, uh, classmates, uh, et cetera. So these types of things where uh, you just display your passion, what, is, what excites you, get going on it, you know, try to make stuff, find a few like-minded people within. It's no different than ultimately what you might do to build a startup that you find some people like starting a club. If you don't have a club in school, start one. Uh, but uh, you can uh, at least get going with that. We in Lexington have a very good community where there are so many different uh, people working in so many different professions, whether legal profession, doctors, where there are scientists and entrepreneurs. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, leverage that uh, from uh, the community. Uh, I think the community, talk to people, talk to your parents, talk to uh, folks, uh, your teachers, uh, talk to your friends, and you'll find people who might be interested, approach them, um, you know, spend some time talking to them to understand how they do it, Maybe there's an opportunity to shadow people for some period of time, go in, you know, for a day or two. Um, um, so just that interaction, and it will also give you the ability to communicate both with your peers as well as with the elders and stuff. And uh, that's something that you know, most of life basically is can be distilled to doing two things. One is curiosity, and the second is diligence. If you have curiosity to keep finding, you know, why is this is happening? What's happening? and then you follow it up with diligence in either researching it or learning about it, you'll find that you're unstoppable. Curiosity and diligence, those are the only two things you need and the world's your oyster. Thank you so much. Okay, so I think we're running uh, low on time. So does anybody on the panel have any last thoughts that they would like to share before we wrap up? Yes, uh, if I may, a couple of minutes, Manasi. Um, all I would like to share with the, especially the audience students, uh, first of all, thanks. Number two, start looking around. Curiosity will give you the breadth and then your diligence will give you the depth. That's how you're gonna become good at anything you do. You know, break small things, put it back together, learn new chapters or go back to this uh, you know, school work that you already done, how good you can be if you do it again, or for the, uh, like, uh, the grown-ups, uh, college students or high schools. Uh, start looking around and see what you, uh, it's equally important to know that what you don't like, okay? And put them in the don't like column, but don't erase it because never know at one point in your life, you wanna go back to and see if you wanna tackle those or get into those. That's my word, thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, go ahead, um, Professor Segal. Yeah, I would just like to add uh, for everybody here, <clears throat> whether they are in middle school, high school or working is if you like something, you think of somebody 
who can be a mentor to you, reach out to them. Uh, most people are more than willing to help others, but you have to take the initiative to reach out. So whether it's at middle school, you want to do something with an engineer, with a scientist, with a politician, whether it's high school looking for, high school student looking for a research project, or whether you are in uh, working in industry, catch somebody, send them an email, they will 90% of the time reply to you, positive or negative doesn't matter. They'll put you in touch with somebody who can help you. Everybody there gets this happiness out of helping others, whether you believe it or not. So if you really want to get some opinions, work with somebody, reach out to them, it's all up to you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Wade, did you have anything you'd like to add? So, um... You know, in the AI, we actually have a very interesting algorithm. It's called a simulated annealing. So basically, the idea is you want to find the best solution. And then the way you find the best solution is you have to take high risk. So high, so especially when you're young, something out of your comfort zone. So, so that is why I often told my daughters, you know, you don't have to well plan everything. You don't have to introduce some randomness into the search and then allow yourself to go, you know, explore unknown areas and just do it. Don't think, don't think it's too complicated. Just do it and then explore the paths and find the solution along the way. So for the young students, my, my, my go home message for you is try new things, take risk, high risk, high return. So this is my message for you. All right, so I want to thank everyone so much for being part of this panel. I know we could have probably continued um, talking for the next hour or so, but I did want to let you know that we do have breakout sessions at three o'clock and four o'clock. Some of our panelists will be joining us for that. Unfortunately, the three o'clock breakouts are full, but we do have spaces left in the four o'clock breakout sessions. If you go to our um, website, the IndianAmericansOfLexington.org backslash events, and I will send the link um, a little bit later, um, if you click on the speaker bios, we have listed all of those different speakers will be present on each of those breakout sessions. So it's not just going to be the panelists. We have a lot of outside experts coming in, um, alumni and, um, you know, some fields that we didn't even talk about today. So please do take a look at that and join us if you are able. Um, at this time, I did want to, since we are, I know we have people attending from um, outside of Lexington, but for those of you guys in the Lexington community, we did want to share with you a message from uh, Johnny Cole, who's the Director of Diversity here in Lexington, uh, just to give you a little bit of a local context um, with everything that's going on. Um, so, Christine, if you wouldn't mind sharing that video. Hello, Lexington learners. Thank you for joining these workshops on multiple pathways to success. My name is Johnny Cole, and I'm the Director of Equity and Student Supports for the Lexington Public Schools. In our schools, we are exploring very similar concepts. For example, part of our recent strategic plan includes redefining success within our community. In my role as Director of Equity and Student Supports, I'm excited by our district's commitment to issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and making sure that all students, regardless of any aspect of their identity, have the full opportunity to thrive in our schools. Part of this work is surely what you'll be focusing on in these workshops, as the college and career landscape continues to shift and change in the coming years. As we become increasingly diverse as a society, including demographic shifts we have seen in our own community over the past decade, we have seen a greater collective belief of what we've articulated in the LPS strategic plan around diversity, equity, and inclusion, including that people from different backgrounds offer new ways of seeing the world and solving problems. In fact, researchers have found that diverse teams produce better results in nearly every field. The evidence is clear. Diverse groups of problem solvers outperform the groups of the best individuals at solving problems. And this is in the forefront of our mind as we think about shifts in the way we educate students for the future. All of our students need to be ready to engage with others who are different from them, whether that engagement happens in the workforce, in college, or in our own community. As you engage in this workshop about future trends in education and careers, consider how we all can get better at working across differences in order to make our world a better place. Christine, we are not able to hear the message. 
Oh, did you not hear it? I heard it. I think it was uh, interrupted in, in the middle. Um, Mom, it might just be you. I think other people were able to hear it. Okay. Do you want to turn your video on and conclude? Me? Hi everyone, on behalf of Indian Americans of Lexington School Committee, I wanted to thank everyone for joining in the call and we had a great set of uh, uh, panelists and keynote speaker and I, I'm hoping that all of you got something, you know, uh, information that you can make use in your life. Uh, I wanted to thank our partner in crime, Carrie Library, um, Cal, Calex, JPX, uh, Colax, ABCL, and BALX, as well as Lexington Public School. Um, I really want to thank uh, Julie uh, Hackett, who is the superintendent of high school, uh, superintendent of um, Lexington Public School, and Johnny uh, for providing their support to us. And at the end, you know, I would like to thank our whole school committee team to put this program together. And a special shout out to uh, Christine from library. Uh, who did an amazing job to put up everything together. So thank you so much. And we are hoping to see you in the breakout session. Thank you again. See so you guys again, uh, we still have spaces left in the four o'clock breakout session. I sent the link to our website. If you click on the speaker bios, you'll be able to see all of the experts who will be joining us for each session. Okay, so we do, um, there are some people who are only attending one or the other. Okay, but we do still have representatives from pretty much all of the fields that were present in the panel, as well as additional ones during that second breakout session. And there you can have more, you know, personal contact, uh, smaller group discussions, more focused discussions. So please do join us for that. Um, as Christine shared in the beginning, we will be posting um, a recording of this. Uh, we will be sending you a link to the recording um, of this video after the fact, as well as some resources uh, we'll be collecting from the panelists. I know you've seen in the messages that some of our panelists have kindly shared their personal contact information. If you guys would like to get in contact with them and if you're interested in their fields, but we will be collecting that information together and sending it to you um, as sort of like a post event um, resource list. Um, and any last minute questions from anyone in the um, attendees or any last minute comments that anyone on the panel would like to do before we conclude um, this event. Okay, Christine, um, is there anything you'd like to say in closing? Just like to say great job, Mansi and Archana for organizing it. Thank you. Thank you. I will echo my thanks um, back to you, Monsi, and to your mom and to, uh, for partnering with me and for working through all the technical issues with me. Um, this is the largest uh, virtual event that the library has hosted. So there were a lot of different pieces to work out and I'm grateful for your patience and feedback uh, in the process. Um, and I'm grateful to all the panelists who shared their time. You all are considered experts in your field and so you have lots of demands on your time and um, it's, really, really generous of you to share your experience and uh, knowledge with people who are maybe in a different place than you are. So I appreciate your participation today. Um, to everyone who registered and to the panelists, if you would like, I will be sending out a follow-up link to the YouTube video uh, when this is done and it's been posted. And we always include a feedback survey where we ask people what they thought about the event, what else they'd like to see the library offer. So I will be sharing that with you as well. And um, if you have feedback specifically for IAL and the panelists and those who planned this, I will pass that along too. So. Just a big thanks from the library. All right, everyone, thank you again to panelists, speakers, and attendees. We hope to see some of you in the breakout sessions that follow um, at three o'clock and have a wonderful rest of the year Saturday. Thank you.